Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Captain Holly Weaver, and I am here to welcome you to the fifth Army Medical Recruiting um, My Army Medicine Story live stream show. I'm going to go ahead and bring up my co host, Captain Parham. Hey, hey how are you? Doing? I'm great. It's a wonderful Monday. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Um, it is already starting out to be a very busy week, but it, it is. I am awesome. I'm so excited because we are back with another great live stream guest. And I'm just really excited to actually feature family medicine. It's crazy because we have never actually specifically highlighted family practice. We've, you know, discussed it, but we haven't had a family practice physician on here. So that is going to be super exciting. We've been talking to him backstage and we definitely know that he is going to have a lot to bring to the table. Um, so what do you think? Should we get this thing started? Let's do it. Hello. Hi, Dr. Fenderhorst. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Captain Parham? Amazing. It's Monday. How could you not be doing amazing on Monday? Uh, if you had a Friday off, maybe turn it into a Tuesday. <laughs> That's perfect. Captain Parham, are we going to do our fancy intro or are we skipping it this time? We're always doing our fancy intro. I, okay. I actually look, I, I look forward to the fancy intro. It's I know I actually was building up our fancy intro. Um, and so I feel like we kind of need to do it now. What you do you think? Up so much. Don't we let built me it up. We can't. All right, Let's here we go. Okay, did we let you down? No, no, not at all. Like Will Smith wouldn't even slap you for that. It was amazing. <laughs> Okay. Um, hmm. <laughs> well, tonight we're here to have a live stream show <laughs> on family medicine. Um, thank you for that, sir. So um, we are glad that you enjoyed our intro. I could see you actually dancing in the background because I can see the thumbnails when we're backstage and I could see you actually grooving. So that was I, pretty. I saw that. that. that I stood good. up, started doing the robot and everything, just kind of. Yep. We just feel like it really kind of gets you excited and energized about army medicine. And, um, can so I, yeah. Can I just say, uh, one of our viewers just sent me a gif of Will Smith. So, uh, the first, first Prince of Bel Air and that's, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sergeant Randall. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to add this, uh ticker where is it it has my contact information banners um so that way if any of our live stream guests they want more information about army medicine they can um there we go thank you very I much they can contact me via email linkedin instagram they can call or text and we can help provide them the information that they need to find out more about Army Medicine. So just to kind of kick things off, we would love for you to introduce yourself, tell us just a little bit about your Army story, and then we'll go through, ask you some questions about what you've shared. And then as we get feedback and interaction from the audience, you know, we'll kind of ask more and just kind of chat over the next hour. Sounds good. So my name is Ryan Vonderhorst. Uh, I'm currently an active duty physician serving at Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, I'm a major. I'm an MD. There's two kinds of docs, uh, primarily MDs and DOs. Uh, I was enlisted quite a few years ago. I switched over to the officer side back in 2011, going to med school at KU Med in, uh, in Kansas, uh, both in Kansas City as well as Wichita, Kansas. I did my residency for family medicine at Fort Benning, Georgia, which was wonderful. And then for the last four years, I've been stationed here by choice at Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, in two separate units, going to NTC, going to Poland, doing some other uh, entertaining stuff. And then I'm here today. Awesome. 
Thank you very much. So when you, um, back when you were enlisted um, and then you decided to get out, did you meet, like, did you know when you were getting out that you wanted to go to medical school or how did you come to the conclusion of, I want to go from being a medic to being a doctor? Um, I knew that I wanted to go to medical school. I didn't know at that time that I wanted to stay in the army. Uh, I joined the army initially, my brother was in, kind of made me want to join a little bit more. And I chose being a medic because I wanted to actually see if, if getting into some aspect of medicine was right for me and see if it was a good choice. So it was kind of a tester in a sense. I, I very much so enjoyed it. Uh, when I separated from in active duty enlisted in 2005, I felt uh, I did my undergraduate then, and then I was going to go on to medical school. So I, I definitely had a very specific plan in place. What I didn't know is after about a year and a half, I went, wow, I, I really kind of miss the Army, the camaraderie. I'd spent my adult years from 18 to 22 kind of active enlisted. So I was like, you know, civilian world's good, but I certainly miss some of these aspects. So that's when I ended up getting back into the reserves and then ended up winding into the uh, HPSP program, which is the scholarship that the military will essentially pay for medical school if you give them time, which is honestly a very good deal. Yes, absolutely. I would love if Brandon could just kind of tell us a little bit about the HPSP and find out more about your experience with HPSP. Yeah, yeah for sure. That So the HPSP is one of the things when I learned that uh, when I came, so I was a medic as well. And a lot of these programs weren't pitched or like were uh, very, very much unknown to the medical community, right? So when I came out to AMED recruiting and I learned about HPSP, I was blown away that the army is giving away these scholarships to pay 100% of your med school, reimburse you for your books, medical equipment, and for med corps and dental corps, the $20,000 bonus, which I'm sure definitely helps. Um, and I think one of the biggest things after speaking with a lot of physicians is the pay during residency being being paid as a captain and not sitting at your 45 to fifty five thousand um, dollars throughout residency uh but uh from what i understand and I, I would like you to expand a little bit on this but uh the match process is very much similar to the civilian side Correct. As far as, as far as the match, uh, again, I didn't go through the civilian match, didn't have to, but the, the match in the military is at least talking to all my friends that were in the civilian medical school with me. The match was very similar. Uh, the, the benefit is I knew about three months before everybody else did. So while everybody in mid March is like stressing out over where they're going to go, I want to say I found out like mid or late December, as far as where I was going to go. So it really kind of, I knew for about six solid months rather than finding out two months before I started residency. It, it gave me a nice heads up there. Perfect. And so one of the things that we hear a lot or get asked a lot, I suppose, is how much different is a military residency compared to your civil civilian residency experience? Um, how much army stuff do you have to do? You know? Yeah. So residency, so keeping in mind, of course, residency is a it, essentially a civilian institution where it has to be, you have to check all these different types of boxes, a number of clinic appointments, number of certain types of rotations, number of uh, inpatient, number of outpatient appointments, all those kind of things. So residency really in civilian and military in, in that sense is very similar. We still have to check all the same boxes. Civilians still have to check all the same boxes as us. Uh, both sides have, you know, small advantages and disadvantages like everything else. Uh, the military in residency, we certainly uh, excelled on musculoskeletal things. We would have civilian residents come and rotate with us and they were, they were kind of blown away by like, wait, you can do that? How are you so good at this exam? And we do it fairly frequently. Um, so it's so a good advantages there. And then we also, when we're in our residency, I did mine at uh, Martin Army Community Hospital at Fort Benning, Georgia, which was fantastic. Um, good hospital. It was a uh, 
uh, unopposed program. So it was only family medicine residents. So when you were there, you were the intensive care doc, you were the cardiologist, you were the pulmonologist, you took care of the patient outpatient. Uh, if somebody was in labor, you delivered the baby, you helped take care of baby. Um, you know, you would see them in follow up appointments in clinic, you know, family medicine's wonderful in that sense. Um, the I think the overall overall program is, is certainly very competitive. And then we also, when there's rotations that we can't accomplish at Martin Army Community Hospital or, or at our local institution, we go out to uh, other institutions in the civilian world. We didn't have the highest acuity or the most severe sick patients for our intensive care unit. So in order to gain that knowledge base, we would go out to the local community hospital, or not community, we'd go out to the local medical center hospital within the community and uh, and essentially learn in their ICUs. So we're still getting all the knowledge, all the education that we need, all the acuity of our patients. So we can make sure that we're taking care of both soldiers as well as family members, uh, both deployed and at home. That's awesome. It sounds like it's a very good comprehensive residency experience that you had, especially being that there aren't there weren't other residents there to kind of compete with. Yeah, so so there's other family med residents, but you don't have to share your inpatient right. time with inpatient docs, pediatric time with pediatrics, those kind of things, which is beneficial. Absolutely. So I have a, I have a question based off of that and your experience with your civilian counterparts. All of those things that you mentioned, are those typically things that a family medicine physician would take care of in residency? Yeah, so family medicine uh, is a wonderful... I, I love family medicine because it's you you do everything you, or you can kind of you can get into almost any spectrum in, in one way to look at it, it's a it's a jack of all trades master of none um i know i don't do deep surgeries on people or orthopedic surgeries but i've been in on plenty and i i kind of know my way around in that sense um family medicine is considered one of the three primary cares internal pediatrics and family um so we as family uh, really get to take care of the whole spectrum from newborns to kids to young adults and teens uh, all the way up to talking with family members about end of life care that really is full spectrum for sure there's there's some family docs usually usually a little bit more old school like um you got to essentially like less served communities too and, and you'll have the same family doc working at an ER that has a clinic somewhere and does appendectomies when they're needed. Like they truly pretty darn full spectrum, which unfortunately nowadays is not quite as common as specialties have grown, which I appreciate. It's hard to stay up on all that knowledge and, and the best practices, but um, certainly family medicine is kind of the, the old school full spectrum. So after you completed your residency, what are some experiences that you have had that have kind of stood out to you that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do as a family medicine physician in the civilian sector? Well, there's certainly some aspects like uh, when maybe when we talk location, like I, I was fortunate well in a sense fortunate enough to be able to do a rotation to poland for about nine months it's almost a challenge in a good way sometimes in the army to be able to do more with less you're deployed in more austere environments you have instead of working in a, in a wonderful staffed hospital with tons of drawers and you just get to open the drawer and grab whatever you want um, you have to go out, you have to build a tent, you have to set up your supplies, know how it needs to be set up, educate your Joes, um, and then be able to do life-saving procedures out there uh, if it's indicated. And, and you have to be able to do it quickly and fast and be proficient at it. I would say that's certainly one thing that uh, kind of sets, sets us aside from civilian counterparts, but that's something that's post residency certainly in in residency in all reality the the military trains you just as well and perhaps a little bit better than uh, uh civilian counterparts in in my opinion you know, not does not represent views of the us army <laughs> i do oh. have um just a question about your residency um did you ever like from your friends that did civilian residencies, did you ever like know how much they made? I mean, when 
you know, like I'm looking up a residency coordinator or something like that. Uh, it says, you know, what a year one, year two, year three resident makes. And yes. when you're a captain in the army, you're making significantly more than that. So, you know, did you ever hear like your friends talking about, you know, how much they made and, you know, how tight it was kind of financially? I know exactly what you mean. Um, I have been fortunate enough being both enlisted and going through the HPSP that I have never taken out a student loan and the army has financed 100% of my education, which was awesome to say the least. Uh, civilian counterparts, when I think I heard uh, Captain Parham say it earlier, civilian counterparts in residency make somewhere around 45 to 60,000 a year, um, plus taxes, plus uh, having to pay for their own health insurance, plus a lot of those things that that can certainly bring that number down a little bit, a little bit faster. Um, so, so you're you're pretty darn accurate with those numbers, of course, adjusted for different parts of the country a little bit, but they certainly certainly don't have a doctor paycheck. In the Army, um, when you first start your residency, when you graduate medical school and start your residency, you get you transfer up to a captain, which has a pretty, pretty darn decent pay. Plus, the Army has other benefits like BAH, the basic allowance for housing that helps with a housing allowance every month, basic allowance for sustenance, for pay, uh, for food pay. Um, they pay for your health insurance, all those things. So easily i'd say i probably made twice what my civilian counterparts made which on top of not having any student debt to pay off or that accrues or gains interest during residency it's a pretty significant financial advantage absolutely thank you of course so, so i have a question regarding residency as well and matching uh was family practice your first choice or Second choice, third choice, whatever. Seventeenth, <laughs> just kidding. No, family medicine <laughs> was my first choice. Um, very similar to the civilian match is you essentially rank what specialty you want to go into. So like family medicine, and then you rank all the locations where family medicine is at. So, um, you know, certain locations, especially when you talk to the army are more desirable. People for I, I I still haven't figured out why people always seem to want to go to Hawaii to do their residency, um, and, and that's of course no you know that Colorado and Seattle are the are the more desired and sought after areas. Um, I'm a little zoned. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what was the question? One more time on that. Yeah, just just if that was your first uh, choice. Oh, thank you. So. It, it family medicine, like I said, was my first choice, but it um, the location was not necessarily my first choice. I got selected into a different location, but definitely family med was my first choice. I going through medical school. I see lots of you. You do lots of different rotations in medical school. You do rotations in pediatrics and OB and surgery rotations and and all sorts of other specialty ones in GI and internal medicine. And every time I did a rotation, I was like. Oh, this is fun. I love working with kids. I like pediatrics. Um, it's hard working with the really sick ones, you know. Um, oh, the geriatrics rotation. This is great. I actually really like working with people and talking end of life care. Uh, surgery. Oh, this is kind of fun. Dermatology. Oh, I love procedures. And family medicine kind of falls nicely in there because you can still do a, a full spectrum of that. You know, just in clinic today, uh, let's see here, person with a... Uh, uh, hip labral tear. Uh, I got to remove uh, a couple of moles from a uh, gentleman. Um, trying to think of what else I had this morning. Um, I think I had just standard younger guy with nausea vomiting, you know, so you still get it, it's not a, uh, it's it's not like the most broad, but you can still get a pretty good spectrum as compared to dermatology every day at skin GI every other day you're sticking tubes in places. So it's so nice to have a spectrum with um with you being family medicine do you have a desire to expand and do a, a fellowship and specialize more um and if if that's the case what does that look like in the army um i i i can't say i'm the most versed on it but i know a little bit so family medicine is a is a specialty in and of itself um just like internal medicine just like pediatrics etc it's just one of the uh, primary care specialties um, the Army does also allow GMOs, uh, which they complete one year of internship in. 
if I wanted to move above and beyond those, so the Army still allows kind of, well, the Army as well as the civilian world um, still allows two primary options. One, if I wanted to switch to a different type of specialty, you can do that. So you essentially just apply just like you did when you're out of med school and you apply to get into something else. You have to make sure that you don't owe time at certain locations and, and kind of iron out those details. But um, people will do uh, 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 people will do other residencies. People move from OB to family medicine. Um, Nadia West, the uh, former Surgeon General of the Army, she was family practice at Fort Benning, and then she switched over to dermatology. Um, so you can you can carry multiple board certifications. If you want to move higher within your certification, um, there's different fellowships that the Army offers. Uh, there's a small variety of those for family medicine. Off the top of my head, there's a fellowship in, let's see here, sleep medicine, pain medicine. Um, there's a internal medicine. There's a OB fellowship. Uh, I think there was a geriatrics fellowship, but that kind of has fallen to the wayside a little bit. I think there's a wilderness medicine, which I don't know enough about, but just sounds awesome. And I, I want to say there's seven total. I just can't think of them off the top of my head. But there's certainly certainly the same options that are available in the civilian world are available to you. And and as this kind of spectrum goes where there's a will, there's a waiver. The Army, even in re like residency, doesn't have its own, to the best of my knowledge, uh, like cardiothoracic surgery residencies. So people will go that are active duty military, they'll get paid military, they'll do the civilian residency to learn the skills and then jump back into the army to continue their time. Um, and you can do the same thing with a spectrum of fellowships as well. Yes, I have actually heard of that where um, some specialties, they will allow that for residencies and fellowships. Um, to do them in the civilian world, it's a little bit, you know, like if the military offers it or the army offers it, you're most likely going to be doing it with the army. But if there's a specialty that someone is wanting to go into and it's not available, then that is a possibility. So I, I definitely have heard that before. And I've also, we've had live stream guests that or a specific specialty, and then they decided to completely change. We had a general surgeon that ended up going preventative medicine mm. like um after a while I th colonel robinson uh, i think his name was um but yeah so i think it's really that's kind of nice that the army you really like you can change paths and you can kind of make your career your own um and i think that's the same thing not only for our doctors and surgeons but also, you know, nursing and just medical in general, because there's so many different career paths, you can kind of go more the clinical route and really focus on the patient care, or you can focus on the leadership route and doing, you know, a lot of um, things in leadership, you know, running clinics and, and things like that, um, and even potentially command opportunities. So I definitely think just you have the chance to... Um, you know, broaden your um, abilities and just kind of be like um, a jack of all trades, I guess you could say. Sir, so we had we had a uh, conversation backstage. Please tell me about your your mug. It was oh. quite interesting, actually. <laughs> this is uh, it, it's just silly stuff. It's a little bit hard to see, but that's a the Caduceus, and it's a. This is a U.S. Army Medical Corps uh, Car China Company uh, mug from 1943. I, I have a just a small collection of like military China from World War II era that I just find really interesting. You know, I've I've got this cool kind of diner dish from 1927 that I just imagine old not old people but people from long ago. You know, yeah, yeah, you have some like private that ate on it that grew up to be you know. Uh, some uh some commanding general or something like that not that really privates move over like that that often but you know what i'm trying to say it's just the, the history behind it is honestly wonderful and it and it makes me happy so and sorry are, are, are you a history going. are you a history buff then <laughs> i i That's like history thing. i am i'm i wouldn't say i'm a history buff but i i certainly enjoy it uh good lessons to be learned um gives you good perspective for how honestly darn good we have it nowadays. Um, 
you know, we can drink the water and we have mugs that don't have lead in them. Well, this might, hopefully it doesn't. <laughs> you know, I, th you... I think that, Go ahead. I was just saying, I think that every time I watch like a World War II or a World War I movie or a Vietnam movie, it's just like, man, like sometimes when you're out in the field, you're like, man, this really sucks. But then you look at that and you're like, it's really not that bad. <laughs> As you turn on the heater to your Humvee and you use your ration and you make a nice warmed meal and then sit on your phone doing something. Right. Yeah. Personal problems. Yeah. So have you been to the AMED Museum in San Antonio then? Not right. since 2002, I would say. Okay. Uh, I last went, I think, in 2016 or 18. And, it, I mean, it just has just a lot of amazing stuff. And it's really quite miraculous, all the things that, all the artifacts that they have there and all the history that's there. So for everyone out there, if you're ever in San Antonio and um, at Fort Sam, definitely check out the Army Medical Department's museum. It's like right when you get on post, it's really nice. I think it's free for admission as well. Oh, nice. But, okay, so I have a question for you. Yeah. What um, skills, like leadership-wise, do you think that the military has kind of helped prepare you um, as as a physician, you know, versus, um, or like that you'll be able to take with you once you retire or you transition to civilian life? What, um, what do you think that that kind of, that edge offers you? So let's see here, military leadership skills transferring in specific to medical. Um, you know, one of, one of the bigger things that I could see is off the top of my head. Uh, so as a physician, usually you have, especially in the military, some what we call mid-level providers, be it nurse practitioners or physician's assistants working under you. You're what's called a supervisory physician. Currently, I think I have five that are under me and, and cool. You know, I, I work with them every day. They're great people. Um, it, it's really nice civilian world generally monetizes something like that um so in the in the military you just kind of you get used to it and you, you do the work and there you go the civilian world actually would pretty significantly monetize that and simply being if, if i had my job in the civilian world uh overseeing them that alone would be about an extra hundred thousand a year on my paycheck which would be pretty darn significant um there's lots of leadership skills because in a sense the military it's good to be uncomfortable sometimes. Being uncomfortable helps thrust you into other positions and helps you learn and you have to ask questions and you have to figure out stuff. You know, the military is not a organization in which you're sitting in a cozy little bubble comfortable the whole time. So they're like, here, this is your job now. Please figure it out and, and do good at it. And so you get in and you, you learn all about it and you do good about it. I'm sorry, somebody's at my doorbell. Someone has at the doorbell. Hopefully it's my kid. We'll find out. He likes to press it if they're home. Um, sorry about that. That's okay. uh, so, so you kind of get thrust into positions in sometimes it's a frustrating way, but a lot of times it, I mean, it's how you learn character and it's how you learn skills. And in the civilian world, people see, oh my goodness, you know, he, he was a medical director of a clinic. Um, you know, it's a position that you're essentially thrust upon and then you learn and then you do your do your darndest to do a good job. Civilian world translation for those leadership skills honestly are, are fantastic. People see that and they're like, oh, oh, wow. OK, we have to get this guy. We have to hire this guy. Um, so a, lo a lot of the even just common day to day stuff that you do, uh, the military, depending on your position, um, I'm a brigade surgeon right now and I was formerly a battalion surgeon, so kind of a lower level. You frequently get uh, some clinic time, some like leadership administrative time. So you have to work with the higher ups in meetings and you have to educate your commanders on, on the medical health of the troops. Um, you have to get made a little bit uncomfortable in order to continue to get better. And, and civilian world loves that because civilian world is we have a guy, we get him out of residency and we see them out of residency and then they just see patients all the time. So they don't get thrust into those roles or skills. So long and short it's pretty beneficial for the leadership skills that we attain in the army so that leads into my my next question 
it's something that we talk about a lot. And I, in my experience with speaking with civilian physicians and the difference between the leadership positions, uh, how do you feel like the army has trained you in those leader leadership positions? And do you feel like those, that training and those situations will help you move forward in your career on the civilian side? Um, I, I certainly think that the uh, the situations and everything will will certainly help uh, you know lead us up. Ideal world situation is you do the left seat right seat ride where you come in, you parallel somebody in your same position for a small amount of time. They teach you the ropes, and then you continue on in the military. That does not always happen. Sometimes you ascend or or end up in a empty position and you kind of have to figure out what that position is. So sometimes um, sometimes things are asked of you and you're like, oh, I didn't even know that was part of my job. And sometimes sometimes you can honestly develop that position or that, that job into something bigger and better than what they expected it was in the past. Um, you can expand upon your role. You can do different things to help out your troops, those ideas. The second question I have is, do you feel like being a combat medic prior to being a physician has helped you out in your career and to expand? Very much so. Very much so. Awesome. Um, maybe maybe not even specifically that I was a medic, although that, that definitely leads into some of it. Uh, specifically being a medic, that, that helps because I know what I liked as a medic. I loved being able to go into clinic with my provider. I worked with a wonderful PA uh, uh, captain, now Major uh, Yuri Rivera, honestly, fantastic guy. Um, it was it was so great. Like you'd, you'd be able to work with him and he, he would show you a knee examination 10 times and you would help kind of learn what's wrong with the guy's knee or, or be able to do procedures and, and the amount of teaching he would do. Like, I, I loved that. I loved uh, kind of going up to those levels. Um, but general perspective, I think being enlisted prior to being an officer was really important because being an officer, you there are ideas where, you know, you, you, you get a better paycheck and you still work similar hours to the enlisted guys and everyone works really hard. Um, but the enlisted guys probably get some more of the some more of the the, the short end of the straw. Um, they, they get the short draw a little bit more sometimes. So it's I think nice to have that perspective, and it I think that makes you a better leader for those guys because you know what tasks are. Every, everything's number one. Everything's an emergency, and it, and it kind of helps you know which tasks are actually the emergency and which tasks you need to protect your guys from so that way they have time for recovery or they have time to um, uh, to, to live their life without um, totally being taken advantage of, perhaps. Right. Yeah, no, I would absolutely agree. I was enlisted prior to being an officer, and I, I feel like in the same very same sense is helpful um, just – and, and not only that, but understanding, like you said, understanding the, the perspective of like, this is going to come down. This is what the uh, down the line piece is. I mean, I, I remember sitting there and loading and unloading connexes for however long, you know, and then as a PL also being out there and like, hey, so you don't you don't have to be out here doing this. I'm like, yeah. I remember being in your position and I'm here with with that. Um, and I'm sure you remember loading and unloading connexes. <laughs> well, I mean, even, even my, my current job, I, I haven't had to do any of that. I've only been in it for about maybe seven months. Um, not quite in that situation, very clinic based, but you know, as a battalion surgeon, uh, going to NTC multiple times, like I'm, I'm not sitting in an Omvi catching air conditioning. I'm, I'm holding up the middle of the tent. I'm lifting the tent. I'm setting up chests. I'm making sure everything's good to go. Uh, Connex is going to Poland. Hey, if we're going to set out stuff and do inventory, I'm, I'm right there with them because we all work together. Absolutely. That's awesome. 
I have a question about deployments and, and rotations for you. So when you do, like when you went to Poland, did you primarily just practice primary care, family medicine, or what kind of clinic um, things did you do while you were there? What kind of experiences did you have? Yeah, so um, certainly didn't practice full spectrum family medicine because uh, um, while there's some young kids in my unit, there's definitely no infants in my unit. Uh, and then geriatrics, uh, about the oldest we get up to is 55 or 60 for the army. Uh, while in Poland, we set up a, uh, essentially an aid station slash clinic within a building. We would take care of people for all their, you know, daily needs from colds to, uh, uh, diseases of young men and women to, uh, uh, a lot of musculoskeletal type injuries. And then sometimes we'll find some more interesting ones. We found a, a, a lady with a very interesting kidney condition that was genetic that needed to get uh, actually evac if she was kind of going downhill, unfortunately. Um, uh, some very kind of, I mean, we'll, we'll do whatever. Uh, we, we set up and we have the supplies that we have. Anything else, you know, classic kind of phrase for the army, beg, borrow, or steal. Um, in this case, we, we actually go out to the civilian economy, um, TRICARE uh, remote, nope, not TRICARE remote, TRICARE when you're deployed, I can't think of the name. Uh, they actually essentially authorize care, you go out to civilian facilities, that allows you to get labs uh, beyond your capability, MRIs, advanced imaging, hospitalizations if needed, and then you just kind of help track and monitor some of those patients as they're going through there, go to the hospital every day, check on them. Just kind of make sure they're doing okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I always kind of just wonder, you know, what are different experiences like, especially, you know, in different settings. Um, I personally have not deployed or been on a rotation yet. I kind of have balanced my career as well as having children. So it just hasn't kind of lined up. For me to, and I also haven't been in the right, right unit at the right time. And I think that's kind of a misconception of a lot of people that actually kind of holds them back from wanting to join Army Medicine is they think that they're going to just deploy all the time. But it's, you almost have to be at the right place at the right time in the right position to deploy, especially as medical professionals. So it's a lot harder to deploy than people think. Um, and it's, you're not just always deploying strongly concur there there's certainly positions that most people will elect and know that they're going and trying to get into this position that are a lot more operational or deployment centered some of the special operator type folks um but there are certainly i would say the majority of the positions uh hospital based um my position doesn't necessarily deploy i'm in a i'm a brigade surgeon for a sustainment brigade whereas the brigade surgeons for like the armor or infantry brigades may deploy a little bit more so there's there's certainly the possibility, but no, it's not like a, oh every every five days we're going on a new deployment some someday. For sure. So my, I mean, my experience has been a little bit different. Um, mainly, I've been in some some very deployable units, 82nd and 100 101st, uh, 4th ID, stuff like that. Those so, are perfectly good airplanes. You don't need to jump out, sir. That is a common misconception. Those are not perfectly good airplanes. It's probably better if you do jump out of them. <laughs> I've had too many emergency landings. So um, <laughs> that's I hear that so often. I'm like, no, it's not a perfectly good airplane. I promise. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Go Total ahead. disclaimer, like, obviously, if you're going to be, you know, somewhere like the 82nd, like you have, Brandon, you're deploying a lot more frequently. Um, I just think, and then especially to your position as, you know, when you're a medic, you know, you're going to, if you're in with line units and stuff like that, that comes with the territory. If you're working in a hospital, um, they now have a new structure for, they don't call it being Profis anymore. They call it being mapped unless they change the name again. And so you're, you're mapped to the hospital from a combat support hospital unit. And then, you know, you would deploy that way. But uh, I just think it's uh, just kind of important to, you know, talk about like, 
you can have a family and be very successful. And, and don't you have a family as well, um, sir? Uh, I do. Uh, I actually met my wife in medical school. We have two kids um, that are both uh, kind of in preschool and uh, first grade. And so I met her right when I first started medical school. So she's kind of been with it the entire time, moving for residency, moving to duty station. Um, it's honestly been been fantastic. We're, we're pretty happy. You know, it's, it's not always the easiest to move, but going to a location um, that, that you think you can kind of, you, you got to roll with the punches sometimes too. I wanted to go to Fort Riley. Other people don't want to necessarily go to Fort Riley. Um, you know, my friend's in Tennessee and he loves it. He didn't anticipate it, but you get there, you roll with the punches and he is incredibly happy, uh, happy living there, happy working there. Um, he also has, I think, three kids. So he's, he's got one up on me there. So I don't want to shed a negative light on deployment. Okay. So personally, I, I love being deployed. I absolutely, I, it was a, it was a huge benefit for me. However, at that point in time, I didn't have a family. It does become a little bit more difficult with family, but I don't know. I, for me, it's a much simpler life, right? And I kind of enjoyed that. You work out like four times a day <laughs> <laughs> and deployment, nobody, you, you don't have to, you don't have to cook. <laughs> yeah. Deployment certainly is, is a different life, you know, and, and again, you know, life, life, no one can have this amazing, like perfect life. Every job comes with ups and downs. Part of the army job comes with an awareness that you can deploy. That's, that's part of putting on the green suit, even though I'm in green scrubs. Uh, that's, that's part of putting on the green suit and going to work is knowing that, that those are possibilities, you know? Um, Absolutely. Certainly, certainly some deployments are better than others. Certainly other duty stations are better than others, but, but rolling with the punches, um, rolling with the punches is, is, is certainly very important there. Uh, Poland was a fantastic deployment. Uh, I, I went there, fortunately, just pre-COVID, so we didn't have a lot of those disruptions. It's hard being away from kids. You know, I, I watched uh, my youngest, he was one at the time, and then I came back and he went from like crawling on the ground to running up to me and then not really knowing who I was. And then like, wait a minute, uh, who, who's this guy? But, but honestly, after that, things things went great. It was it was really nice to kind of rekindle with him. And, and uh, uh, it, it was honestly great watching him grow up, especially today in exactly what we're doing now, this video age. Uh, um, for my kids, I would send silly little videos. I would go places and I put a sock on my hand. It was a little sock puppet. And I would go to like different places through Poland and I would be like, oh, hello, Robbie. This is a wonderful big castle. And I would just just silly things like that because it was fun. Um, so you just, you, you kind of have to do what you can do while you're there and, and know that you're, you're there for, you know, good reasons and, uh, and then just kind of be patient to come home and, and hopefully everything works out and works together. You know, I, I would say I, I'm fortunate that, uh, things held together very, very well while I was gone. Um, you know, my wife is, uh, wonderful, uh, able to take care of the kids just fine. So we're, we're in a fortunate environment in that certainly. Um, and I definitely acknowledge that, but, um, you know, the, the army does, does provide a lot of things, uh, to help out deployed spouses and such as well. So it, it's pretty beneficial there. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with deployment and just a little bit about your family too. We really enjoyed hearing about your children and how awesome your wife is because she definitely sounds like the real MVP taking care of the kids when you're gone and, and at and work working. as well. And yes. Working. And working. Oh, <laughs> and she's working. Yeah. Which is a doctor. Superstar. Is she, so you said you met her in medical school. Was she also attending medical school herself or you were just in medical school and that's when you met her? Uh, right when I was starting medical school, it was a mutual friend's birthday party and I met her. Um, she was in residency. She's an optometrist, so not oh, a wow. MD, um, but she's an OD. That's okay. really awesome. Talk about a power couple right there. That's great. <laughs> yeah, and you missed the, the nice Transformers and Legos conversation we had backstage oh um, yeah I don't miss that. <laughs> even just I'm like sure. the door into my office is like i have to weave through this little path of like transformers and legos that they left out from the other day and i'm just like i'll just step oh brio can't forget the brio 
Yes. I can only imagine that's exactly how Captain Weaver's. No, that's literally out. my, no, that's my living room right now is Legos and dolls and LOL dolls. And just like, I've been putting it off, like doing full clean. I'm just like, it'll be there tomorrow. There's no, yep. you know, there's no rush. But the next thing that we'd like to do is kind of go through a few. We have some kind of shout out, nice comments. And then we have just a couple quick questions on here that we're going to pull up. And then we'll kind of wrap this up. We're about at 645 right now. So the first question that we actually had on here was from someone who left a comment before our live stream started. And this comment is directed at us asking if we could discuss Army Reserve Medicine in another video. And we definitely can. And we have in the past. Um, if, uh, Caddy, if you'd like to check out our library on our YouTube page, which is where you're commenting from, we have many videos on Army Reserve Medicine and different specialties that you can check out, but we plan to make more of these live streams and we can definitely focus more on reserve medicine in the future. Um, and then um, our next comment is... From a Joseph Martin, very cool, looking good, Army team. Thank you for your comment and for tuning in. We have a comment from Michelle who tuned in on LinkedIn, which is really nice. We're actually streaming to, I think, five different places. We're streaming to our um, station Facebook page, our battalion Facebook and YouTube page, our future soldier uh, page for our battalion, and we're streaming to my LinkedIn. So we're really casting a wide net. And even after the live stream, like if people don't tune in live, you know, they're able to watch it and um, find out the information. And I'll hey, so with, so with, yeah. So with that um, previous question or comment, I suppose, can you expand a little bit of, on how your medical school experience was with the army and HBSP? Oh yeah. Um, so the, the kind of scholarships that are available just really briefly, one of them is, is full military that's called USIS, uh, uniform services, university of health sciences. And it's like full army slash Navy slash air force, like medical school all combined. Um, the HPSP is by far the most predominant one, um, the Health Profession Scholarship Program. Long and short, they pay for your medical school. You owe them time. In it, you're you're pretty much a civilian. I had a, I had a beard the whole time. Uh, you get activated once per year for, I think it's 45 days. The first year, you get activated and your orders say, here, we're paying you extra. Stay at med school and learn things. Okay? And I want to say the second year was very... Uh, or excuse me, the second year was that the first year they activated you and you went to Bullock basic officer leadership course where you kind of learn the basics of being an officer. And um, I'd already been in the army, so I had some experience. Uh, certainly a lot of people were new and were less experienced and, and definitely got more out of that course about how to be in the army. The second two years were the uh, most wonderful. Um, because you get activated for your clinical rotations. So you do what's kind of called interview rotations. So you get you get activated. So um, instead of being a civilian, you get active duty orders that say, hey, we're paying you extra. Please go to these locations. You interview and apply very similar to how you would in the civilian world to go to outside rotations. Um, and so I did, uh, let's see here. I did rotations at Joint Base Lewis McCord. Um, the primary and best one is that I got to do a month in Hawaii. Um, so I went there and I did a cardiology rotation and a gastroenterology rotation. Everyone there was wonderful. Got to got to kind of meet different people, learn uh, learn you know the specialty care for cardiology and GI, but also of course um, I. I I can't think of a single other job in the world that's going to send you to Hawaii for 30 days so you can learn things and also go to the beach for a while. It was that was a fantastic rotation. So so you're a civilian the whole time except for little 45 day gaps and that's about it and those 45 day gaps honestly are pretty awesome. It Thank definitely you. sounds Thank like you. it. They, they also provide they also provide benefits so you get a monthly stipend um, i'm sure you know a little bit more about the details on that but you get a monthly stipend that helps you cover uh, rent utilities etc 
Um, you get supplies for the most part taken care of. You know, there's always caveats, but uh, you get your books taken care of. You get uh, uh, certain fees taken care of, stethoscope, uh, um, black bag. If you go to DO school, you can get uh, you can get supplies taken care of too. That's awesome. I think I'm ready to uh, to apply. Captain Barb, do you think you can help me out? <laughs> I have an MCAT of five ten. Yeah, oh. I got you. Hey, no, I'm just I'm just kidding. But I just let me get you a social security card. <laughs> All right, I got it right here. Let's let's get. And this I'll take your mother's maiden name. Oh, <laughs> right, and I'll give you my birthday. Um, no, truly, it is an amazing opportunity. Honestly, if I wasn't already so invested in being an army nurse, I love army medicine. I would seriously consider like going, I actually have friends and no, no army nurses that have ended up going to medical school and are now, you know, doctors in the army. They started out as a nurse and then decided they wanted to go the uses route. And, you know, so I think it's just an amazing opportunity all around. Um, you know, there's just so many different paths you can take, you know, even for, you know, just staying in nursing, CRNA, family nurse practitioner, psych nurse practitioner as well. So the opportunities are really endless. But to transition to our next question, uh, Staff Sergeant Courtney Aquino would like to know what your favorite duty position has been since you have been in the Army and why? Um, hey, Courtney. So don't get me wrong. I love my current unit, but it is not my favorite duty position. Uh, I, I really love being a battalion surgeon. Um, it was a hard, challenging job, uh, but incredibly rewarding. I, as a, as a battalion surgeon where I was, you, you get your close group of medics, you get your close group of, uh, we, we had a physical therapist, we had a nurse with us, we had some behavioral health techs, um, or excuse me, behavioral health, like uh, psychologists and social workers. And, and you get this incredibly close knit group of people. Um, you get you get your group of medics with it. You get to learn. You get to train together. You get to work together when you deploy together. I mean, it, it truly kind of felt like a family. We we were Charlie Med, um, which is kind of a uh, in a uh, brigade support battalion. That's the the classic uh, uh, medical group. That was easily my favorite one. I got to train medics, and we got to put on classes. I got to challenge them. Uh, we would do kind of operational type training, you know, more on the, uh, the hardcore fun medical side with trauma focus. We would do more didactic sometimes. I, I really enjoy teaching. So it gave me a good opportunity to teach anybody who wanted or was able. And, and I, I would say easily that's been my favorite position. Yes, we deployed a little bit more. Yes, we went out to the field a little bit more. But every one of those was also an opportunity to help kind of influence these guys Again, I had a really good mentor, Yuri Rivera, years ago. Um, it was it's something that stuck with me and uh, has, you know, felt felt good in the heart for years. And uh, I, I I hope to be half as awesome as he was to me, and and I hope that they view me a quarter of awesome as he actually was. Awesome. Thank you so much. And that definitely really kind of just highlights the importance of like a mentee mentor relationship and how powerful it truly can be your mentor is still making an impact on your life and, you know, just how you view, you view them is really kind of like helping you, you know, lead your soldiers and, you know, just, um, I think that's really amazing. So it looks like, um, she left another question for you, bringing in the great questions to kind of bring us home. She would like to know what advice you have for an aspiring enlisted soldier who wants to commission. Um, so obviously I don't know all the, um, the technical ins and outs, but the, the way I did it is I, I did a kind of a separation from the army and went into, uh, I did my undergraduate, that kind of stuff, um, for four years. I joined the reserves in the middle of that. And then I joined medical school after that. First off, you get tuition assistance, knock out all of those things as best you can while you're active duty and get as many of the prerequisites, undergraduate degrees, uh, you know, bachelor's degree, associate's degree knocked out while you're still in the army. Put in the time and the effort, people will work with you. I was really hesitant when I was younger. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what I'm doing. All I had to walk in, do is walk in the room and they would have taken care of everything for me. I just didn't have the... Um, 
uh, the guts to walk in the room or the, really the, the drive to walk in the room at that time. Strongly regret that. Um, so, so try to get as much of that done as you can while you're while you're still in the army, um, and then you can choose. There's green to gold programs um, that you could switch over. I think it would be a little bit harder most of the time for HPSP. My understanding, at least, is that you need to have a, generally speaking, a bachelor's degree, a prerequisite, and an acceptance to medical school done. So, if you need to get out for four years uh, or three years or two years. Um, to, to go to undergraduate, get accepted to medical school, and then, uh, you know, jump right back in. Like, sometimes you hear people say like, oh, you know, but I'll be, I'll be 30 by that time. I'll be 35 by that time. It's like, no matter what you do, you'll be 35 by that time. Like, do what you want to do. Enjoy it. Like, I didn't start medical school until I was 28. I had a classmate who was 20, you know, so eight years difference. That's pretty significant. But I'm, I still look forward to probably 30 more years of practicing right now. Like I started late and I still have tons of time down the road. You're never too late to do that stuff. Um, so try to get those prerequisites knocked out. Um, having a good relationship with a mentor mentee can sometimes help as far as letters, um, you know, work, working hard to kind of, to get a plan, to write down a plan for what you want to do. Um, actually try to research things in a realistic manner, you know, go to schools, websites that you're interested in, look into the programs, do they accept the GI Bill, do they accept tuition assistance? Sometimes you only have to put in a little bit of legwork and you can get a lot out of it. You're welcome, Courtney. All right, and Brandon is gonna take our next comment. So, with this, um, one of the things that I find when we go to conferences and whatnot, um, a, a lot of people, physicians walk up and they say, oh, no, I, I'm good. I'm, oh, Siri, Siri decided that she wanted to chime in on my end. <laughs> um, they say, no, I'm too old. I'm too old. I'm too old, which is almost never the case. Um, I had the, I was able to commission a 53 year old physician, uh, medic, uh, actually family practice medicine, uh, physician. And I, one of my SMEs that I, that I use a lot is a 58 year old, um, OBGYN, right? So are you, are you too old? Is the age waiver not attainable? Non attainable? No, it is not. 100% not your experience is very valuable to the army. Um, I, I would not worry about the PT test at all. It has changed. Uh, we've moved on to the ACFT, which is significantly different, different, but it's, I wouldn't say it's difficult to pass. Um, because they just added in the age and gender standards, which makes it, a lot um, better for, um, you know, people to, you know, not feel like they have to go out and like injure themselves when they take the test and they can do it to their ability. Um, because before they kind of had like a gender neutral standard, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it was causing people to really push outside of their comfort zone. And so the, the current standards, especially for a 45 year old, I'm not sure um, if you're male or female based off of your name, but they are very attainable for the minimum standards based off of that age bracket. So, um, and the, you, you know, the awesome thing is you don't necessarily have to be ready to pass the test now because you'll have plenty of time during the application process to prepare. And then you won't actually be taking an ACFT until you go to your first training. Absolutely. I was just reading that this morning. You have at least six months prior to uh, from, from the time you commission, at least six months before you have to pass it. On top of that, when it comes to like medical conditions and being able to do things, having what we call a permanent profile, uh, the current standards appear to be at least um, that while there are six events, uh, five kind of non uh, musculoskeletal type ones, and then your cardio event, you can be profiled down to just a cardio event. Um, wow. which is not what I think they initially intended, but that seems to be the way it's written now. So as long as you can bike 12 miles, 12 kilometers on a stationary bicycle, you are good to go. 
That's really good insight. Um, yeah. So, um, Dr. Monster, not sure what your role name is. If you would like to chat about this and find out more information and kind of what the whole process looks like, please feel free to text me or email me and we can set up a time to talk. I will love to talk to you and um, just kind of see what your thoughts are and see if I can answer any additional questions for you and help you get started in this process if you're interested. Absolutely. And to add to that, 45 years, so they also subtract the eight years from from 45. Um, and so technically by the Army's, you're, you're below, you, based off of what I have here, you would not even need an age waiver. Um, to expand on that a bit more, for the Army Reserve, you would also be eligible for um, $40,000 a year, $250,000 loan repayment as well and or a $25,000 annual bonus. Which are great incentives. So thank you so much for your questions and hopefully you'll be texting me soon. Maybe this is you right now. No, I'm just kidding. Someone <laughs> else, uh, another lead text me. Um, saying they were interested in working together. So it's a busy time and I like it. Let's put them in scrubs, right? And then there's that wonderful contact information right at the bottom there. Holly R. So. Weaver 3 .mil at army .mil. Yes, that's perfect. Um, the best and fastest way is just to shoot me a text if you feel comfortable. That's my work phone. Um, and then we can get something set up. Thank you for tuning in and asking your questions and I look forward to hearing from you and certain Johnson is on here and he just was bringing the uh, it's called your true age when you subtract your years of service but it looks like that's all of our comments um so we'll kind of just like wrap this up sir do you have any final remarks or anything else you'd like to share with us Oh, I should have some sage wisdom stored up here. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to sugarcoat anything. The Army certainly has its challenges. Everything has its challenges. Um, not everything is perfect. The Army is not for everyone. But I, I think it's a great opportunity for a lot of people. Um, you're going to get into it what you put out. So like, I feel like I've learned a lot, I've grown a lot, I've developed a lot, and I'm a much better person for the time I did in the military service, both enlisted as well as a, uh, as well as a physician. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world. So I, I think it's a great experience and I, I hope, uh, I hope can, people continue to join and, uh, and, and serve. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us and for just sharing all of your experiences with us and your, you know, just words of wisdom. We truly appreciate you sharing your Army Medicine story. And thank you for just sharing a little bit of your evening with us. And thanks to your wife as well for holding down the fort um, while you helped us out. Because these uh, live streams, they really do help us uh, find you know, high quality um, professionals that we can put, um, you know, in the Army and Army Reserve, just like we saw here, someone happened to see our live stream and, you know, that could help us um, fulfill our mission requirements. So we appreciate you very much. It's my, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. It's very beneficial. All right. I will see you all backstage and then Brandon, if you want to close us out with our outro. All right. Have a great night. Hope to see you all ne next time. Thank you.